Well, hello everyone, this is going to be a slightly different video, uh, a little bit of commentary and then a lot of show and tell, not a lot, a little. Um, I just received a message, a very nice message uh, from a subscriber who I didn't know, I don't recall him ever, uh, ever commenting or anything, um, you know, just saying that he really appreciates my videos and that uh, as a result of them, he spends a lot more time reading and he feels like he's, uh, you know, a much better libertarian, a smarter guy. And... Uh, you know, I really appreciate that when I hear that from people. I kind of wonder, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in YouTube and exactly, you know, the dynamic there. Um, you know, you get different amounts of activity and beyond a very, very small amount, you really don't know very much. Um, you know, you get some subscribers who will comment quite regularly and some of those guys you develop a bit of a rapport with and some of them, you know, I know outside of uh, YouTube and, uh, but that's, you know, three percent or something of my subs you know many others people are watching the videos i know that the retention is decently good um but you know what do they think people don't say and people are not look i i'm not chiding people i don't say that's very much uh when i watch other people's videos i don't comment very often um it's just interesting to me so i it makes me curious about who my subscribers are what they think what what are they like um you know, other than just assuming that the people I know more about are representative, you know, which I think is probably an invalid assumption. But anyway, I don't want to just talk about that. I wanted to talk about kind of this notion of, uh, you know, he he kind of pointed out that at one point he was just a Malinuvian and a Adam Kokesh guy, and he thought he pretty much knew it all. And, uh, you know, uh, he was complimenting me, saying that I helped him to get past that. And I think... Um, I think a lot of libertarian. It's something I notice a lot where people get this attitude where they think they know it all. Like they they read one thing, they watch one video, and or, or they they read one author and and suddenly they've got the answer to everything. And you see, as libertarians, we see this a lot, and it's kind of within libertarianism, and kind of the cliches. Um, Molyneux uh, that counts as libertarianism. It's kind of he has his own unique characteristics but there's some of that where you have people who really out of the blue without doing any reading very often um you know come across him and if they are swayed and certainly not everybody is um pretty soon they're they think they pretty much have have it all figured out because quite frankly um he gives that impression i don't care if he explicitly says otherwise now and then he gives that impression um you know, just by using terms like universal and all that. Um, but it's not just him. Look, a lot of the people who get into Austrian economics, they read a little Mises or a little Rothbard or even a lot of those, and they think they know it all. They watch the Mises podcast, they think they know it all. I know I thought I knew it all. The first thing that got me interested in economics was a, a documentary by a guy named Bill Still, a very good documentary for what it, for what it does called The Money Masters, which if you haven't seen, I recommend watching. It's on YouTube. But... Um, if I had never done any more research after that, I would still believe that. But Bill Still is a greenbacker and uh, an anti-gold standard guy. And I, you know, through interest in that, for his documentary, I went on and read more. And I, you know, other than a lot of the history being good and the fact that there are problems with the Fed and he like, points them out, I know so much more now than I did just watching that video. But this is hardly... And a lot of libertarians kind of come off of this attitude, and it kind of contributes to the you're a college kid who doesn't really know anything but thinks you know everything, which is the cliched kind of dismissal of libertarianism, which is unfortunate because it's a very broad, very deep, very compelling ideology. It may not be a majority view, but it has adherence or at least strong supporters, in, you know, as high as you can go academically. Um it is persuasive and it is powerful, but the impression is that you get people who watch one video uh, or a couple videos, and certainly this would apply to people if they only watched mine, although I don't think I have any subscribers who came to me uh, and had no experience with libertarianism previously, although I could be wrong about that. Um, but it's not just libertarianism. Uh, kind of the cliched anti-libertarian answer would be zeitgeisters and TV peers. These are guys who think they know everything about everything because they watched one documentary and maybe some ramblings of Peter Joseph and or Jack Fresco. Um, but it goes 
much broader than that. There's all kinds of people who think that they know everything or know enough or know a lot. And I, I think that what I don't like about that attitude isn't the hubris of thinking you know everything, because that's true. It's that they stop learning. It's that they reach a point and they think, that's it. I don't need to know anymore. I don't need to read anymore. And it's, I don't know, because a lot of people, I have that, you know, I, I was an anarcho-capitalist before I had ever read any Rothbard. And that actually prevented me from reading Rothbard for probably two years. Um, there were probably two years elapsed from the time I knew who he was, roughly, before I read any of his stuff. Uh, and that was the reason, because I thought, I already am an ANCAP. I already know what he's going to say. And, I mean, I knew what the rough conclusions were going to be, but I didn't, it was extremely good for me to read him. And I'm not, I'm using him as an example, uh, but I could use hundreds of others. Uh, I think that what really bothers me and what should bother people is when people think, I know enough, I don't need to learn anymore. Uh, the more you learn, it's not like you become more doubtful or you become less decisive. I think that the more I learn, the more conclusions I do come to, but then the more questions I have and the more, um, more things I realize I could learn about. And that's why I'm never going to finish reading all of my books, because every time I read a really good book, it will cite other books, and I will end up buying at least some of them. And if they're really good, I'll end up buying several more than the book I'm reading. And so my collection is expanding faster than I can accumulate it. Um, now, there's also ways you can go about acquiring knowledge. And one thing I've noticed with myself is that I don't, which, and this explains why I, I, I invest so much into books, is that I don't really like passive, passively taking in information. I, I, I actually don't like to read, by the way. Well, and I sometimes I get questions like, how fast do you read? You know, like I am not a speed reader by any, I don't read very quickly. Um, I don't actually enjoy reading. It's a question of there's information that I want to learn about, and that basically forces me to be a reader because many of the things I want to know about, they're not, they aren't, it would be great if there were high quality informative documentaries about every topic. But the point, the fact is that even the most popularized topics in the world have only a skimming of document, documentary, you know, coverage, even I mean, even something like the Civil War or World War Two. I mean, the be the best documentary ever, in my opinion, and many others, is the Civil War by Ken Burns. It's twelve hours long. It's an introduction to the Civil War. It's an introduction, and you could watch every other documentary about the Civil War and every person, and you would learn quite a bit. But it would still be only a tiny sliver of the material available, um, just because of the costs involved in producing a documentary. Um, I find that. I, I really can't, I, it's not that I can't stand, I can't stay interested in things like podcasts uh, and radio shows. Uh, unless I'm totally unemployed and have nothing to do, I won't listen to them. Uh, you know, and there are, there's a number that are very good, that are very interesting. Um, you know, Free Talk Live is more entertaining than interesting, although it can be both. And there was a time when I was unemployed where I would listen to Free Talk Live quite, quite, quite regularly. Rarely live, because I didn't want to hear the commercials, but I'd listen to the uploaded podcasts. But there's a number of shows on the, uh, Scott Horton has a great radio show um, with a, an amazing archive, um, which I suggest people listen to if they get uh, particularly interested in uh, a, a certain author that he's interviewed a great number of times. Um, his interviews with Hans Hermann Hoppe are great, but it's, you know, he has a show, but he does three hours every day uh, during the week. Um, there's a whole bunch of podcasts. Um, on the Liberty Radio Network and in other places. Uh, I've been on one called Decline to State. Uh, there's one, all oh, the Liberty Conspiracy, Freedom Fiend. I mean, there's a whole bunch. Um, Freedom Fiends is kind of weird, but I got into that for a little while. But I, I can always end up not staying interested because I, I typically want to know about something in particular. And to passively listen to a... <laughs> You know, or Ben Stone, the bad Quaker, he's very smart. He, uh, every time I've gone to Porkfest, he's always been there, and I've always had really interesting conversations with him. But when you're just listening to him, it's I. this is interesting, but I want to know about X, Y, and Z, and you're talking about A, B, and C, and 
how can I spend my time just pass? It's really frustrating. And so this has kind of forced me into the world of books. If there are topics I want to read about, I figure out what I need to learn, what I want to learn, what are the good materials to read in that area. And it depends. There are some things where there's only a couple books that are going to cover that topic. Most of the things I'm interested in are general enough that there's a huge number of books and it's more a question of parsing through what do you want to take the time to invest in. Um, and then really, um, it depends how interested you are. And I'm part of the reason I, I do read as much as I do is even though I don't like reading, I am interested. I want to know things. Uh, I'm just curious about them. And it's not like eating vegetables for me, reading history. Uh, you know, it's not like I'm force feeding myself. I'd much rather read that, especially history, but not only history than, um, you know, nonfiction or fiction. I do read some fiction, but it's very rare. I'll make exceptions when it's exceptional, but that's it. Um, so I thought kind of as an addendum, I would uh, go through, I did all that first just so that people wouldn't be caught up in what I'm going to do next. Cause I did want to actually kind of go through my, my library such as it is. Um, you know, it's, I don't have a lot of space. I can't show you everything. I'm not going to go through every title. Certainly. Um, I'm, I'm, I think in the last year I've had to buy three bookshelves. Um, so, you know, I, it's, it's always, I've just bought, I mean, just today I bought two or three more books. Um, and, uh, one thing though, that I think I will say though, is a lot of them are libertarian books and a lot of them are Austrian economics books, but it's only a fraction. Um, most, because there's only so much, I mean, you can read all of Rothbard's books. You can read all of Mises' book. It'll take a while. They both wrote quite a bit. Um, you can look at the, there's any number of lists of good Austrian books. You know, I have a book, best libertarian books. You can read a big chunk of the directly important libertarian literature. You can probably read all of it debatable of what you include in the list. I mean, if we we could keep making lists of things that and ever expand it, but you could read all of that without too much trouble. Um, now, books that are important that are that kind of could add to a libertarian understanding of the world that that would be just a huge because there's just so many books that would that add that. I mean, almost any history book, any economics books, even ones that aren't Austrian, would be useful in that regard. Um, you know, political science, philosophy, all that stuff would be useful and you know you, you could never read all of that so um i tend to read what's interesting but i get interested in things i don't know a lot but so a lot of you know i've been reading on china and that's because i didn't i just did not know that much about china i know that's this big important region this important aspect of eurasia that's you know coming up in the world and i just didn't know very much about it unfortunately there's more books on that topic than i could ever read and i just started systematically going through but so let me go ahead and uh, kind of walk you through some of what I have. Uh, it's not presented in a nice way, but uh, the first one is right behind my head um, over that lamp. Uh, actually, I had people message me saying, are, are those the Cambridge um, history books, ancient history books? And indeed they are. Uh, Cambridge is a publishing house and they published lots of books, uh, but they've done a series on history. Uh, I believe it's 14 volumes long. And I don't have all 14 volumes by any stretch. Uh, I think I have, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten of them. I think it's more than 14. I think I'm about like 26. Um, and so there they are. And it starts with, you know, prehistory and goes on to the fall of the Roman Empire, essentially. Um, I've only read one of them so far. Um, uh, the one about uh, like sixth uh, and seventh, sixth and seventh century BCE Assyria, uh, um, you know, which I didn't know anything about. Now I do, so that was good. Um, now this is a project. I want to get the whole series eventually. You can buy the entire series for like three and a half thousand dollars. I'm not going to do that. Um, the volumes vary widely in price. Um, some of them have been you know, between 10 and 20 bucks, cheapest ones, most are coming in the 50 to 70 range. And there's a couple that are selling three, 400 bucks. So I don't know what's going to happen, but at the rate that I'm reading them, I can take my time. Um, 
this bookshelf, by the way, is not mostly mine. Uh, it's just stuff our family has. There's photo albums. Like, oh, there's me. <laughs> uh, but I got J George Martin up here. He's not the big exception for my fiction. Um, that Kdioteca basically convinced me to read years ago, a year ago. Uh, so over here we have my first bookshelf, actually, which is mostly has children's books on it that I don't really read right now. But that's this over here, and a Mossberg 500 shotgun, um, you know. But on the top there, see that is you probably couldn't see the the title, but that is the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbon, probably like the classic work. If you're if you're going to read about you know the classics and you're not going to read primary sources, then you would read Gibbon. Um, I had a couple annotated versions of it. I wanted the whole thing. There was a, a, a small used bookstore about twenty miles from where I live. I found it there. It was about a hundred bucks. I was in college and I wasn't going to spend that when I was in college. But uh, eventually, a couple years ago. You know, I had the disposable income, and I went ahead and uh, purchased the whole thing. Still haven't read it. It will be a project one of these days. I don't imagine I'll do the whole thing straight through. It's eight, about seven, eight volumes. There are different printings. I've seen it in two volumes, but that's on like onion thin paper with I don't know twenty five hundred pages and in a volume or something like that. So here we have my main bookshelf and treasure chest. Um, this was this bookshelf was given to me in college. I started really accumulating books in college uh, when I discovered Amazon and got a second job and had the money to spend. And I actually went through and just, I had a huge wish list and I bought all the books that were really cheap, you know, less than a dollar. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And I ended up with stacks and stacks of books and I had a good friend in college and she, uh, for Christmas, actually got me this bookshelf. And uh, it used to be double stacked and filled up to the top, and I've since gotten other bookshelves. But if we look at it, this top here, I've got a lot of the philosophy. You see that? A lot of those are actually new acquisitions. Um, I've only read a few of them. Uh, I will be doing more philosophy eventually. It's a kind of a daunting subject that I haven't really delved directly into. Um, and I don't have plans to in the immediate future, but someday I would like to. Now behind that, I've got Underground History of American Education. <laughs> Introduction to Physical Anthropology. Cookbooks, gold coins some history books back there see it is double stacked so you can't see everything uh, down here got more american history got the eight volumes of henry adams the history of the united states of america right here um i for a couple years uh, attempted with only slight success to learn icelandic uh, that's a whole story in and of itself, and um, I have put that on hold to prioritize just reading actual books. I got to the point where uh, I was like, if I really want to do this, I'm going to have to spend two to three hours a day in study, which I did for a while. Um, and that was taking up all the free time I had to read, and I, I made a conscious decision last summer, over a year ago now, to put Icelandic away for now. But I have all the books still. Uh, on this next shelf, and I don't even know what the... I've got some Ayn Rand back there. Some German books. Dieter McCloskey. Some of the books I've already read. Um, on this next shelf... See there, I have a lot of Hayek and a lot of Mises. I have Human Action in German. Uh, that's a case of going on the Mises Institute website and seeing that they were selling these books for a dollar, two dollars. I bought a whole bunch of them, so I have theory of money. To, I have the 
Theory Day Gals Under Umlaus Mittel. I don't speak German. Um, but yeah, look, I've got three Mises books that are in German, including Human Action, which was originally National Economy. I want. I think that's probably the 1940 edition, not just a translation of the 1949 actual Human Action. Um, Man, Economy, and Liberty by Rothbard. But I, um, I bought a whole bunch of Hayek. I don't think I've read nearly enough Hayek. Um, one of my favorite kind of economists, uh, young libertarian economist, is a guy named John John Fultfinegel Catalan. Very, very, very well read. Um, big Wikipedia editor, was published probably more on Mises' page than anybody else, despite the fact that even now he's probably only 27. Um, and this would have been, you know, five, six years ago. So he's going to publish on there, like, on a weekly basis when he was in his early to mid-20s. Um, he has a really good web page called Economic Thoughts, I think. Um, he's very thought-provoking. Uh, he's a libertarian, but he's not a strict Austrian. But he, I, I asked him once... Uh, you know, what should I read for Hayek? And he gave me a list. Uh, he really thinks a lot of Hayek. So I don't know when I'll get to that, but I would like to at some point. It's there. I'm kind of hoping, like, the economy crashes and I'll be stuck here. And then I'll, I'll read it all the time. Now, underneath there. That's more of a hodgepodge. It gets more hodgepodge. The bottom of there is all languages. I've got books on Yucatec Maya, Hittite, uh... French and German and all those, apparently. Um, this is what I'm reading now. Still reading. I took a detour to read Azar Gott's book. Now, this is uh, my my most recent um, bookshelf. And this is a little bit more organized. So the top is Chinese history. So it's chronological. So, shit. Starts with uh, the Shang and the Zhou. Moves on through the Han and the Qin. There's really not much about the Qin, which I'm surprised. These are all about the Han. And then, you know, these mid dynasties in the later uh, first century, or first millennium uh, AD, uh, I haven't really got to them yet. I have one each. So there's one book on the Sui dynasty. Uh, one on the Tang and one on the Song, which, you know, isn't enough to do it thoroughly, but these will be my introductions. And these are on the Ming, all the Ming, and then these are the Qing and Modern. As I notice, I have three books on the Mao's Famine, uh, Hungry Ghost, Mao's Great Famine, and Tombstone by Yang Jingzhe. Ji Zheng. Don't know if I'll ever read all three, but I did read one of them. Um, I didn't realize I had three until I organized my shelf. Uh, next layer, we've got let's see, ancient Near East, Egypt, Sumer, Akkad. Um, I don't have any books on the Hittite Empire except about the Hittite language. Um, Mesopotamia generally, a whole lot on Sumer, just because that seems to be a popular topic. One on Persia, that's a really good one. History of the Persian Empire by Olmsted. Those are actually Icelandic flashcards. And then this is a little section on guns, gun rights. Um, Boston Guns Bible there is, by the way, on my best libertarian books. Highly recommended that book. Um, Boston Sea Party is a wonderfully readable and intelligent and engaging author. He's very well versed in libertarianism. I met him at Porkfest in 2011. Uh, no, 2012. Uh, really smart guy, really interesting guy, and also he hasn't written so much that you can't read all of his stuff. Most of his books are short, but this is like the almanac, tour de force. E even just regular gun enthusiasts who are not libertarians love that book. It has great reviews on Amazon to the point where a lot of people say, if you're going to buy a gun book, buy that. And it just happens to be by somebody who's this close to an anarcho capitalist. Uh, very witty, very good, and I highly recommend it. If you live if you live in the UK, I'm sorry, it's going to do you no good. If you live in the United States, if you're a libertarian and you're not a gun owner, you should buy that book. Now this next page, next shelf is Russian history and then Soviet history. So 
So we've got all three, all, it's not always divided in three parts, but the complete Gulag Archipelago, which by the way, it's very hard to find that all in a single edition. I don't know why each one is a different part. He has, I think it has seven or eight parts and you'll find part one. Sometimes you'll find part one and two and then uh, you know, it's, I was disappointed. I didn't realize that I had the first part. I read it and I thought, I was almost finished, and I was like, man, this doesn't seem like it's over yet. It seems like it's just getting started, and I finished, and I was like, oh, shit, that's just the beginning. Um, and it was actually quite difficult to find the rest. Um, don't know why that is. It's a popular book. It's been printed, reprinted many times. But, um, yep, so a lot of this stuff is on the Romanovs. I have some stuff from early Muscovy. I don't have anything from the very beginnings yet. Uh, I don't know when I'll get there. I read a lot of Russian history when I was in college. It was a big blank area on the map for me. So I do know a decent amount about like the 19th century czars. And, um, you know, communism is so like quintessentially evil that I have spent a decent amount of time reading about that. Um, and this next page, let's see here. This is um, this is U.S. World War II history. And almost all of these are basically revisionist history on World War II. You see there that the Russian kind of spills over there. I've got the Russian Empire, which is a good um, overview of the 19th century empire. War and Peace, which is a novel, but it's historical fiction. You learn a lot just reading that. And then The Secret Betrayal. And I also put my Japanese books where, which there's only three that are explicitly about Japan. Um, Power and Culture, Japan's Imperial Army, and The Book of Five Rings. Oh, and A Plague Upon Humanity. That's the only one I haven't read yet. But all these American World War II books... Um, there's a whole bunch about Pearl Harbor. Um, John T. Flynn's books are there, As We Go Marching and The Roosevelt Myth. I read The Roosevelt Myth, not As We Go Marching yet. Um, there's a couple books by William Manchester, who is a fantastic author. Uh, he has a famous and excellent history on the Krupp family in Germany called The Arms of Krupp. But he did a, a biography on, on, on uh, Douglas MacArthur called American Caesar. And his own memoir. He was in World War II. Uh, great books. We got Eugene Sledge. A couple books on Patton. Uh, I have a, several books on proposals for the invasion of Japan at the end of the war. Uh, what they were thinking they were going to have to do if they had not used the atom bomb. I think that's the main reason I have those. Um, German plans to invade Switzerland. That's target Switzerland. Uh, books on the murder of Rudolf Hess. Uh, Churchill's involvement in getting the U.S. involved in the war. Uh, a lot of these are older and are not particularly libertarian, but there's a lot of very good um, revision on World War II that's available and not particularly. You know, one probably the most famous book in that area that I don't have is Day of Deceit by Robert Stinnett about Pearl Harbor. But I don't know. I've known about that book now for almost 10 years and I still have never bought it. But uh, maybe one of these days. And then this bottom shelf is English history. English and then French. Um, there's The Mask of Merlin there. That's a good one about uh, David Lloyd George, a critical biography of David Lloyd George. Uh, there's The Years of Secret Diplomacy. That's by a very good free trading, classically liberal Englishman who basically um, showed that the uh, UK's entry into First World War was a tragedy of their secret treaties with other countries that didn't have to happen. Uh, that he published in 1915, and I believe that copy is from 1915. It's in horrible shape, um, at least the cover. The, the pages are still there and readable. Um, and he was this close to going to prison uh, for, for that. He had a good friend named Roger Casement, who, a former member of the Foreign Service in the UK, who um, tried to... He, he tried to allow... He was from Ireland. He tried to have the Irish uh, join the Germans. And he was executed for treason, and uh, I forget his name, but he went to visit him in prison, and uh, he was this close to himself being executed or going to prison for, for that book. Um, but uh, I can't remember his name, but he, 
because and it's and it's been removed from the the, the spine. Um, that's a really good book. A lot of these other ones, though, they're about like uh, Plantagenet, Norman England, Henry the uh, Second, struggle for mastery, the War of the Roses. Uh, those are all you know. This stuff we all kind of heard of. We don't know a lot about this. I was at a bookstore. They only sold that as as a as as a group. But uh, you got seven monarchs, um, chronologically going from Edward the Confessor to Henry the Eighth. It looks like. Uh, not all of them, but the big ones. And then the, the ones on France, I'll say one thing. I've got um, de Tocqueville and Bastiat, but then... The Life of Napoleon Bonaparte by Walter Scott. That is an interesting one. Um, Walter Scott is a famous British uh, author in the early 19th century. He wrote a lot of novels that were quite popular at the time. Uh, as which you know he was a popular author now since then they have really gone off the radar there's one or two that have still if you probably take literature classes in college they might force you to read I think one of them he wrote was called Waverly but he went and uh, did a, a, a book a two volume work on the life of Napoleon Bonaparte uh, and you know he had the great advantage that he could go and interview contemporaries he could interview his subordinates and people like Wellington and and all these people, he he probably could have, although he wasn't able to actually in, uh, interview Napoleon himself. Um, and it's interesting; these are these these books were printed recently, but they are exact duplicates of of his writing. And so, can't I can't pull it out because they're too tight in there. But so the typeset is really tiny because it's the 19th century. You know, they're saving money. Um, let me see if I can get this out here. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is hard to read. I started trying to read it, and it's it's gonna. I'm gonna have to get a magnifying glass. Like it's that bad. I can see it, but like it hurts your eyes. Um, and you know, I don't know what the. It's obviously not been re-edited. It's obviously not. They haven't gone and looked for typos or anything. They just took the original text and scanned it and reprinted it. And I don't know why they would do that. But the reason I have that book, by the way, interesting story. I think I even heard about it in the Money Masters. There's a very famous, famous story that the Rothschilds took over the stock market in England because of them having agents on both armies during the Battle of Waterloo, and they were able to learn ahead of time who won before anybody else knew. Not that they caused who to win, but that they knew before everyone else, and that uh, whoever the Rothschild in London was at the time was able to then manipulate the market and basically take over the entire British stock market. That's a story I've heard retold many times, and somehow, somewhere, I heard that that is the source, those books, and so that is the reason I bought them. When I started reading them, they're quite interesting and informative about Napoleon, but that's actually what got me to get in, into those books. I've had them for a long time, but they're very hard to read. I mean, I assume that Sir Walter Scott is a good writer, but um, it's just the, the font is so terrible. So here we go on my nicest bookshelf which I have to mount my bed to get to. This is a little bit more organized. We have the classics. I was just noticing today, I don't have Polybius, but we got the complete works of Tacitus, Caesar, Livy, uh, Plato, there's Edward Gibbon, Aristotle, I should probably put that over there, Plutarch, Sullust, Suetonius, uh, I have some others, but I put them in other spots. I don't have any Polybius, though, that's a problem. Oh, well. Um, I've read some of those, but it's been a long time. I read a lot of the classics when I was younger. Uh, but then, of course, we have Bastiat, Atlas Shrugged. 
on the next page, uh, we've got uh, Byzantine and then Ottoman history. There we've got Wealth of Nations and then the Theory of Moral Supplements by uh, Adam Smith. Um, I've got four books by Robert Higgs, Crisis and Leviathan, Depression, War, and Cold War, Delusions of Power, and The Transformation of the American Economy. I've read three of those four, so I'll have to read Delusions of Power. Uh, Good Money, George Selgin's book, The Tragedy of American Compassion, The Triumph of Conservatism, and The State by Oppenheimer and The Pursuit of Justice. Those are all good. Uh, this next one's pretty much all Mises Institute. mostly um, Human Action, Man, Economy, and State. Uh, you also see Pieces of Eight by Edward Vieira. That's one of my most expensive books. That's $200 for that motherfucker. He believes in copyright and, and, and intellectual property, and he won't republish. So his books are quite hard to get. you got to pick top dollar at the bottom. So we've got Conceived in Liberty, Wages of Destruction, uh, God and the Machine, Devil's Game, uh, an archaeologist's Bible, that was a gift. My religious relative is giving me hints. Um, <laughs> but uh, those are all good. Uh, and then the Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development by Sutton, that's also very expensive and took a long time for me to get. I actually have a photocopy of Volume 3 because for a long time I, I couldn't get Volume 3 and I, I was able to get it from a library temporarily from a friend who got it from an exchange from another library and I photocopied the whole thing and then a year later I ended up actually getting it. So I do have a photocopy though of Volume 3 which is hard to find. And then, let's see, this is... These are DVDs. South Park, Game of Thrones. Nunchucks, Shark Tank. So uh, this is a little bit more miscellaneous. Here are my investing books. Which I still haven't read. <laughs> um, when I have money to invest, I will, though. Um, these are more not directly libertarian, but ancillary to libertarianism. Uh, but these are all good books. Actually, read most of those, I think. Red Star over Hollywood, <laughs> communist infiltration. Yeah, uh, I can't. I don't even think I can reach the bottom of this. But here's And then at the end there, those are buckyballs. Those are the rare earth magnets put out by that company that you make designs out of them that were banned by the government. Um, when I heard they were being banned, I went ahead and bought thousands of them. Uh, you know, kind of like the last chance you could get any of them. And uh, there I have a whole bunch of them in the corner there. Buckyballs. Uh, there's another shelf down there and I can't, it's dark. I can't really get down there. Um, so anyway, that's pretty much my library. There's a few others laying around. There's a whole bunch of my car. There's some that I have packed for when I go to work. Those are the ones that I immediately am going to read next. Usually every time I go to work, I say, this is what I, I most prioritize and I bring that. And, uh, depending on how work goes, sometimes I have a lot of time to read and I'll actually read them all. I've had little panic attacks where I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to run out of books. What am I going to do? 
I'll, I'll buy one and have it shipped here. <laughs> I've had to do that a few times. But a lot of times I bring more than I'm actually able to read. Because um, like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not a very fast reader. And if I'm busy, you know, people get the impression that when I'm at work, I'm just free all the time. And sometimes I am, but uh, sometimes I'm quite busy and I might not be able to read very much at all uh, or make videos or anything. And you will notice that in the month of November and October, um, or especially the month of November, I made very, very few videos because I was so busy. Um, but, you know, I kind of wonder myself, if I were just to stop buying books, do nothing but read, how long would it take to read all these? And it would take a while. I'm not a fast reader. And the thing is, um, that's never going to happen because I'm going to keep buying more. Um, and I buy them faster than I read them. So I'm digging myself more of a hole. Uh, that's all right. You know, eventually Amazon will fall or, or there'll be some kind of catastrophic uh, disruption in the economy and I'll be stuck here with, I, I mean, look, I have a year's supply of food here. I have guns and silver and all that shit. Like, <laughs> they look good on the shelf and also it's nice to know that, you know, if I really had to, I could, uh, of course, what I would do with that information in the survivalist. I have survivalist books too, I think, someplace. So that's all right. But anyway, yeah, don't ever stop learning. Don't ever think you know everything. I don't think you found all the answers. Maybe you've come to some definitive good conclusions. I certainly have. I mean, uh, you know, if, if, if you're going to take a thousand steps in your intellectual journey in your life, it really only takes four or five to conclude that the government shouldn't exist or that it's horribly, you know, screwed up in some way that needs to revolutionarily be changed, at the very least. Um, but that doesn't mean you should then stop and be like, I figured it all out. <laughs> means you should keep taking other steps and, and learn about other things. And and even if they're not directly related to libertarianism, the more well-read you are, um, the better you're able to argue. Because it all, it all is interconnected, you know. I have a hard time totally dismissing any one topic. Because even things that seem totally unrelated, they have some element there that's informative for other things. I mean... Uh, kind of just today, uh, looking at Tom Daly, because Tom Daly, unsurprisingly, came out as basically gay today. Um, when I watch him, like, on this diving board and look at his Speedo, I still end up thinking about how much money does he make and what's the uh, marginal revenue product of his value to the consumers and what's the economics of you know like and what about how does nationalism play into the into the olympics and blah 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 and what are the epigenetic reasons that he's a homo and all that kind of stuff so even things that don't seem that that are that related if you have a critical eye and you really analyze them they can be quite insightful um still i i have this impulse at the very least that there are some things that are meatier that there are some things that are that seem like they're more important, but I have a very hard time really quantifying or qualifying that. So I'm reluctant. I, I, I'm admitting that there's a, I have that, that feeling, but I'm also qualifying this. I don't know if I can, I can really prove that. Um, I mean, just today I bought a book on football. I hate football. Like I hate football. I'm going to read the book and I'm probably going to make a video about how much I hate football. This is American football for all my UK subscribers. Um, on so many levels, I just, something about it, like, you know, like if there's a resonance to my frequency in the universe, that's like the distance, it's like claws on a chalkboard to me. That I think there's something to be learned there. So I bought a book on it. Uh, because of Reason TV made me, basically. And some of you are going to get that reference, probably. So anyway, that's it. Uh, thanks again for, um, I won't say his name because he didn't indicate he wanted me to acknowledge him. But for the person who sent me that very nice message, I always appreciate hearing that kind of stuff. And... Uh, Please, I'm probably going to get book recommendations here. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I don't make any promises. I mean, some of my subscribers, dude, GS Debunked has come on numerous times and told me I had to buy books. And I have a whole bunch of books he told me I had to buy. And then, I'm like, okay, he doesn't read the books. I tell him he has to read, but whatever. Um, do your own reading. Um, you know, read what makes you interested. Until we get to the point, and we're probably not that far away, where Google can stream the information right into your head. Um, you know, it's the only way to go. And, you know, even once we do get to that point, it's going to look on, good on your wall. So um, anyway, that's pretty much it. And I'll talk to you all later. Bye bye.